And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the CC uh, Policy Forum on uh, the Transatlantic Security uh, in Peril, a uh, Ukraine at work. Uh, for those uh, of you who are not familiar with the CEC, it stands for the Central and Eastern Europe Coalition. Um, established in 1994, it comprises of 18 national organizations representing Americans of Central and East European descent. Uh, we have Armenian, Belarusian, uh, Bulgarian, Czech, Estonian, Georgian, Hungarian, Latvian, Lithuanian, Polish, Romanian, Slovak, and Ukrainian diasporas uh, with strong ties with these countries. Our members uh, not only have a great deal of insights into each country, but also have a vested interest in supporting peace and security in Central East Europe and the US. The coalition serves uh, as a liaison between these organizations and together we coordinate our advocacy efforts with respect to the US policy that affects countries of this region. My name is Veronica Metonice, and I am president of the Georgian uh, Association in the US, which is the oldest uh, Georgian diaspora organization in this country. And uh, in fact, we were uh, celebrating 90th anniversary this year. And we are, for past 20 some years, we've been proud members of the CEC. Uh, and uh, we do believe that Together, we can achieve uh, a lot of um, good things. We've uh, called attention to many important issues, um, um, such as NATO enlargement, Russian aggression towards its neighbors, US assistance program, uh, programs for the region. Uh, and um, today, we are discussing the transatlantic security uh, challenges in light of the Russia's uh, war in Ukraine. So uh, obviously, Ukraine has been the focus of our intention um, for past several months. Um, and uh, last month, we've been talking about its uh, impact uh, on the Black Sea. Today, we will be discussing more broader uh, issues uh, with the transatlantic security. Um, and um, we have great panel uh, put together uh, by our uh, members. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, set the stage uh, for Michael Safke, uh, who will be the moderator of this discussion. And he will represent our panelists in a little bit. Michael is a relentless advocate for Ukraine. And uh, he's a former president of the Ukrainian Congress uh, Committee of America. Uh, since 1996, he has served as director of the C, uh, CA uh, Washington DC Bureau, Ukrainian National Information Service, the Ukrainian Community Advocacy Arm in Washington DC. And Michael is a great um, a moderator. He's been moderating uh, most of our policy forums um, especially since the uh, Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine. Mike is also chairman of the U.S. Committee for Ukraine Holodomor uh, Genocide Awareness and was instrumental in the establishment of the Ukrainian uh, I mean, um, uh, Genocide Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, Michael will uh, introduce uh, all our panelists in a second, but before that, I just like to go over some housekeeping issues um, and uh, say that this uh, webinar is recorded, is being recorded and you can uh, access it after um, uh, after 1.30 at ccadvocacy.org. And uh, we also ask you to uh, ask questions in the uh, Q&A uh, part of this uh, webinar. Uh, we will be answering them uh, as, uh, you know, as the uh, we will be answering them uh, at the end of the uh, panelist uh, discussion. And uh, we encourage you to ask more questions uh, because this will be the best uh, part to use our um, panelists. They have great insights uh, into this uh, uh, war. They have a lot of uh, fresh information. So please uh, feel free to ask all the questions. And uh, Michael, please take away. 
Veronica, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, again, Veronica, thank you for, for truly that uh, very generous um, introduction. Um, and it's an honor to moderate once again the Central and East European um, Coalition Policy uh, Forum Series. The topic of today's discussion is going to be the transatlantic security in peril, question mark, Ukraine at war, in which we'll explore the current political, the economic, the military context of the war in Ukraine, with, of course, an emphasis on the effects on transatlantic security and the democracies um, throughout the world. So the Central and East European um, Coalition has assembled two stellar experts um, who will provide their unique perspective and analysis of the policies and the mindset of the aggressor state and the economic impacts of global retribution for Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine. But given the context of current dramatic events in the region and the developments with our allies in the European continent, we're looking at obviously the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine eight months ago, beginning on February 24th of 2022. The recent, most recent use of uh, Iranian-made drones in Ukraine, the explosion of the NS-1 and NS-2 um, pipelines in the Baltic Sea, the G7, the EU, and NATO summits that were held earlier this summer, as well as the upcoming G20 summit um, in two weeks in, Indo in, in, in Indonesia. And the big question there is, will they or won't they meet in sidebar discussions, that being President Biden, as well as the authoritarian leader of the Russian Federation. The buildup of Russia's militarization of the Crimean Peninsula and in the Black Sea region the extent of expanding economic sanctions, Ruski Mir, Russia World, and therefore we'll hear from our panelists and seek their counsel, their analysis, their policy recommendations for a united transatlantic policy towards Ukraine, one that advances our interests and the collective security of our allies. Now we'll hear from our experts, but prior to our panelists, um, as Veronica had mentioned, I just want to clarify one piece of housekeeping um, um, items here to all of our audience members. If there are any questions to the experts, they are to be submitted in the Q&A function down below. Uh, I will be reviewing the questions as well as um, my colleague Veronica from, uh, from the Central and East European Coalition, um, and we'll pose them and announce them to the, to, to the panelists after their presentations. And now to our panelists. I will commence with short bios, um, starting ladies first with Dr. Agnia Grigas, followed by Paul Massaro. Um, Dr. Agnia Grigas is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council working on energy and geopolitical economy. She's the author of three acclaimed books, The New Geopolitics of Natural Gas, Beyond Crimea, The New Russian Empire, and The Politics of Energy and Memory Between the Baltic States and Russia. She has testified for the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources on American LNG exports to Europe. Dr. Grigas was an energy and FDI uh, uh, foreign direct investment advisor to the Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She started her career as a financial analyst at JP Morgan and subsequently advised on emerging markets for Eurasia Group, Barclays Bank and other Fortune 100 companies. Mr. Paul Massaro is a senior policy advisor for counter-corruption and sanctions. Paul's work has advanced the recognition of corruption as a national security threat. He has been described in the media as one of America's foremost corruption experts and, quote, an endless source of democratic ingenuity. He has worked, over, worked on over 13 pieces of counter-corruption legislation and facilitated the founding of the Congressional Caucus Against Foreign Corruption and, and Kleptocracy and the Interparliamentary Agency Alliance Against Kleptocracy. Paul also um, covers German-speaking Europe and East Asia. Paul is regularly quoted and published by major media outlets such as the New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, and Foreign Policy, and he speaks frequently on panels, such as this one, um, podcasts and broadcasts about corruption, sanctions, European security policy, uh, et cetera. His work is featured in uh, Casey Michelle's book, American Kleptocracy, How the U.S. Created the World's Greatest Money Laundering Scheme in History. 
So with that, um, again, ladies first, look forward to an opportunity for, for Dr. Grigas and for Paul to present their opening remarks uh, of about 10 to 15 minutes, followed by um, a vigorous round of, of questions and answers. Um, the floor is yours, Dr. Grigas, please. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, Today, I'm going to speak with you as we're entering potentially a very difficult winter, as the war has been dragging on for eight months. Um, really, there are questions and concerns about transatlantic unity, transatlantic security overall. So today, I want to actually take a step back um, and re-examine again what uh, are Russia's aims, what Russia has been doing in Ukraine, not just the past eight months, not just the past eight years, but what have been its uh, imperial ambitions, uh, frankly, in the broader Central and Eastern European region. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and I'm gonna share a presentation or some slides, uh, which essentially um, we're gonna share a framework I developed in my second book, Beyond Crimea, The New Russian Empire. You know, I wrote this book uh, right, well, I started writing this book right around the time of Crimea's occupation, and this was published in 2016 from Yale. So, um, but in some ways, you know, a lot of things have changed, but in some ways, uh, little has changed because, again, um, the underlying motives um, and the method remain uh, remain the same. So, we are at eight months of war right now already. What? what have been the implications already, uh, already for the public of Ukraine. I mean, we have some 12, 14 million refugees. Uh, we have um, counts of some 6,000 civilian casualties, though quite likely that number is significantly higher. On the Russian side, we have at least, um, at least 60,000 troops um, dead. Uh, we have um, at least a million that have fled in recent months. Uh, fleeing mobilization and overall the crackdown and this kind of return back to Stalinist times in Russia. But at the same time, uh, we, we know that this has been indeed eight years of war um, since February 2014, since uh, this first effort to grab uh, land in Ukraine. Um, for whatever reason, I, I still find that both Crimea's uh, annexation and uh, the war, the invasion this year has come as a shock to many, probably not this community that has probably their experiences of their themselves, their parents, their grandparents, but it's still for whatever reason has come as a shock for a lot of the, um, the policy establishment and um, um, you know, foreign policy commentators, a lot of the talking heads on TV. Um, frankly, if we look at that framework, if we look at Russia's aims and methods that it has been pursuing, well, we can say at least during Putin's regime, if we go back to during the Soviet era, if frankly we go back to the methods of the Russian empire, um, we really see a lot of policy continuity. So, you know, for me, this was never a shock. Um, I can tell you my grandmother in her kitchen could have explained a lot of these uh, dynamics <laughs> and not any worse than a lot of the talking heads in Washington, D.C. But, you know, here we go. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to uh, take you th through some terminology and some jargon <laughs> that my grandmother wouldn't have used um, for this. So. In my book, I proposed um, essentially that one way we can look at Russia's foreign policy is through what I call a seven stage re-imperialization trajectory. I can say I got some flack when the book came out in 2016 that I was being a little bit, you know, um, maybe too dramatic that annexation, you know, wasn't gonna be um, something in the, in the cards that Crimea was unique, um, a unique case. But again, of course, over the last eight, eight years, we've just seen, you know, a more and more aggressive Russian policy and, in fact, um, occupation of territories in Ukraine. So really, uh, the pretext for this expansionism uh, has been the so-called compatriots. Um, what are these compatriots? You know, these are, um, you know, Russia has defined them in a wide variety of ways over the last 20 years of um, their policy. But in the most basic terms, these are Russian speakers who reside outside the Russian Federation. 
So this uh, trajectory really is um, centers around Russian soft power, progresses to humanitarian policies, compatriot policies, passportization, you know, handing out of Russian passports in the in the near abroad countries, uh, information warfare, and as well cyber warfare, and then calls for protection and annexation, final annexation, like we've seen in the case of Crimea and <laughs> last month, um, again, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, so this is a map uh, from, um, from my book uh, that essentially in gray, in these gray zones, you can see, um, that I've highlighted in here and here, what would be areas with significant Russian speaking populations. Um, and these have been the targets of uh, Moscow's so-called Russian compatriot policy that the Kremlin has uh, repeatedly, you know, now has uh, sought out to so-called protect. Um, so, uh, you know, if we look at, um, you know, again, so this is what would be Russian speaking populations. And if we look at the map of how the conflict has shifted in Ukraine, we kind of see a parallel, an echo of that. Of course, the invasion with Ukraine being surrounded, but an effort to try to secure and occupy southeastern Ukraine, essentially, again, where Russia can claim these so called Russian speakers reside, uh, where so called compatriots. Um, so uh, at the time I was doing interviews with inhabitants, um, with, with these Russian speakers in Odessa, and I had selected Odessa in particularly as the third largest uh, Ukrainian city and also largely a, a Russian speaking city. And, uh, you know, it's interesting for me to think, you know, already the things these individuals were saying back in 2014 and thinking how their lives have evolved since then, where are they now in terms of as are they refugees? Are they have they been injured? Are they in hiding? Have uh, how has their life turned out? So um, this was Yelena, and she was a recent university graduate from Odessa. She was living in Kiev for work at the time already, and uh, she she was from a family. She was born and raised in Odessa, in a Ukrainian family, um, but it was always you know they always spoke Russian at home. And she was explaining, look, here everyone speaks Russian, but we're not Russian. We are Russian-speaking Ukrainians and patriots of our country. And probably, you know, I, I wish Putin would have maybe read that sentence. Maybe he wouldn't have been so confused, right? Or, you know, whether he's going to be greeted with flower, his tanks are going to be greeted with flowers um, uh, in those Russian-speaking parts of Ukraine, right? Um, and here she goes on, based on my experience, it's a myth that Russian speakers are discriminated against, pressured or intimidated anywhere in Ukraine, including Western speaking uh, Ukrainian territories. And again, a very already telling sentence. Um, I wonder from whom Russia is going to protect us, from ourselves? What is happening in our country should be decided from within and we do not need outside help. So, and here's another another young woman, I, I have three of them that I wanted to highlight. Um, so she was a young marketing professional. And you know, at the time she spoke some English, she was hoping to travel to America one day. Um, and you know, it's, uh, it's interesting actually, in fact, right now uh, we have a Ukrainian refugee living in our home um, who is also from Odessa. So it's, uh, you know, the parallels for me and you know, how much these uh, past eight years, um, you know, have, uh, well, how much has it has unraveled for the population of Ukraine? So, you know, again, she highlighted she has no grievances as a Russian speaker in Ukraine. And she goes on to say, in a democratic society, everyone has the freedom and the right to speak the language of their choice. We don't have fascism or totalitarianism. Nobody dictates the language we speak here, and certainly not in my region. Russia should turn its attention to its own domestic problems and not to the domestic problems of a neighboring country. And finally, Margarita, um, who was uh, a student of marine logistics at the time at in Odessa University, and she dreamt of working in merchant marines. She had Russian roots on her paternal side. And, uh, you know, she went on to say, look, R Russia and Ukraine are two separate countries. I have never lived in and will never live in Russia. Um, she certainly didn't think uh, Russian speakers needed any sort of pr protection. And uh, again, reiterating, like many others I interviewed, that all problems can be solved from the borders of our own country. So I'm going to take a look a little bit at uh, Russia's uh, foreign policy trajectory um, 
step by step. And again, when we discuss um, what we can do uh, and how we can influence policy, it's very important that we consider these factors again, because these are the arenas that Russia is playing with. So, you know, one is soft power, but you know, I can say Russian soft power is a little bit different than when we think of, you know, kind of our own American soft power. Really, it's a power of coercion, this kind of um, um you know, much harder soft power than we would think of. But really its efforts is to try to use the linguistic, cultural, religious, and economic ties um, as they try to appeal to the 35 million members of the Russian world. Again, the Ruski Mir. And, you know, this term, um, you know, Ruski Mir, it, 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 probably for those of you who speak Russian, maybe uh, quite a number of you, you know, again, uh, Russian world, or um, the term also mir can mean both world and peace. Now, of course, it's ironic uh, when uh, Ukrainians state, oh, the Russian mir has come, uh, you know, not Russian peace, but certainly Russian war. Um, and there are a lot of concerns also, as I'm coming back here, that this uh, Ruski mir, um, why do we have some concerns in countries like Georgia about and Kazakhstan and so on about the mass Russian emigration into these neighboring countries now as Russians are fleeing mobilization. There are concerns again that with the sizable presence of Russian speakers or ethnic Russians or Russian citizens in their countries that they could be potential future targets as well for Russian meddling. So that's a very real, honestly, very real concern. Um, it has nothing to do with you know, liking or disliking uh, the Russians or the, those who are fleeing mobilization. And another element here is the 150 million members of the Russian Orthodox Church um, with um, here Patriarch Kirill, who has really served as a mouthpiece for the Kremlin um, throughout the region. And uh, I put up a little anecdote, well, particularly the joke also that's now going around in the neighboring countries um, of Russia, such as Northern Kazakhstan, for example, so where people say, well, I'm afraid to speak Russian, those that were traditionally Russian speakers, in case Putin thinks that he will need to liberate me. So I think while this is also the basis for, you know, kind of the initial steps of Russian influence and meddling in the near abroad, um, at the same time, I think this uh, soft power is really falling apart for Russia uh, since, um, since the invasion. A second element is, um, you know, so-called humanitarian policies on the Russian side. And we see that again in the case of um, um, this year where, um, you know, deportations of Ukrainian families or children to Russia are being presented as in fact, humanitarian policies. So I won't touch on that too much for the sake of, um, for the sake of time. And if we look at um, compatriot policies overall, um, I detail this extensively in my book because, in fact, this has been about 20 years of um, uh, policies, laws, um, foreign policy uh, principles that have been developed in, under Vladimir Putin's uh, regime, but frankly, that go back uh, to the 90s, that go back even of course, even echo the policies of uh, Tsarist Russia. So uh, this map now takes a bigger picture of uh, the regions where um, Russian speakers reside. And we see again, Northern Kazakhstan, parts of Kyrgyzstan, um, uh, an element um, here in nor Northern Georgia, uh, although uh, in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, many indeed were not Russian speakers. Um, before uh, Putin decided to liberate them, an area in Armenia around the Russian military base. Now, of course, Belarus and again, parts of Estonia, Latvia. Another element which is happening actually under our eyes right now is uh, this passportization. So essentially handing out Russian passports to inhabitants of newly occupied territories, um, such as uh, in Kherson. Um, now, Russia used to do that uh, consistently since the 2000s. They were handing out Russian passports to the inhabitants of South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia to later try to justify their claims that not only they're going to protect Russian compatriots, because again, that's a nebulous term, but really they're going to protect Russian now citizens who reside in these neighboring countries. Um, um, this ta tactic was also done in Crimea before 2014, 
there were efforts to spread as many Russian passports as they could before the actual um, occupation in 2014. And um, again, even this, the data I have already between 2000 and 2009, there were some 3 million people in the former Soviet Union who had acquired Russian passports. So, um, you know, in a way, this pass passportization is an effort to, you know, you're changing before you even bring your armies in, you're changing the facts on the ground and you're changing the citizenships of, of the people in question, sometimes with bribes, sometimes forcefully um, and other methods. Now, another element is uh, information warfare and cyber warfare. I really hope that, um, you know, as a community that understand Russia's uh, foreign policy and aims better, we can really um, advocate um, for the banning of RT and Sputnik um, as widely as possible. Um, really, this is a question, this propaganda, Russian propaganda goes through state-controlled media outlets that are both targeting the domestic audience and the international audience. And in addition to that, of course, we have cyber warfare, we have the troll factories um, you know, that are well documented already um, working in St. Petersburg and Moscow and beyond. So... The next step is uh, calls for protection. Now, these calls uh, typically are originating more from the Kremlin than the actual people in question. Um, this is an image from um, a uh, Russian tank arriving into Georgia. Um, but it's uh, an effort to try to institutionalize this protection for um, the, Russia, the Russian speakers or any other, frankly, ethnic groups, as in the case of Georgia, like the South Ossetians or Abkhazians, outside of the borders of the Russian Federation. And um, you know, the final step, annexation, where we see the Putin rally last month um, when he announced he's uh, taking into the Russian Federation Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. And of course, already the precedent for that in 2014. So um, I've asked you to take a little bit maybe of a historical look and a broader look at this framework and what is happening um, beyond just Ukraine, what is happening in Russia's near abroad and the longevity of these policies. And I would also like you to consider even a broader context for this. Um, that we're truly, truly in a global geopolitical contest between democratic and authoritarian states. And that unity for us as members of democratic societies is absolutely crucial. Um, and it is absolutely crucial to our, our, our own future security in the transatlantic alliance. Um, frankly, I think we've seen over the years, this is not just a question for Russia's near abroad, not just a question for Ukraine, that we cannot, um, uh, as you know, Western societies cannot hide uh, from these ambitions of authoritarian states. Uh, we've seen, again, meddling in, as uh, Russian meddling in every single, I would say, significant uh, election that has taken place in Western Europe um, over the past decade. And of course, we've had our own experiences here in the United States. So I thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Dr. Grigas, that was uh, fascinating, um, at least for me. I know I took a lot of notes, so I hope uh, those in the audience took notes as well. Please um, don't forget to, uh, to put your um, questions to the panelists in the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. Um, and with that, no further ado, um, Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. And I actually think Dr. Grigas led me, left me with a, a really nice segue because I, I think she's absolutely right. I think the the kind of uh, topic I want to discuss is 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 sort of what's happened in the West and sort of the the policy of democracies. And I think you're exactly right, Dr. Grigas, that we find ourselves in a new era. The you know February 24th is effectively for me, and I think for many people I work with, the end of the post Cold War era. It's the end of illusions. I hope, although many people uh, continue to cling to those illusions that we can. Uh, have supply chains and financial relationships and so on and so forth with authoritarian regimes uh, who will weaponize them and weaponize everything uh, into uh, malign influence in democracies. And, and we'd been warning about this, uh, you know, at the Helsinki Commission and, and you know, compatriots of mine and, and, and others that have been working in this space have been warning about this for 
you know, well over a decade now. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll say, you know, it's, it's really wonderful to speak with you all because of course, had we listened to the Baltic states and the Ukrainians and the Polish and the Finns and, and, and so on and so forth, just a little bit earlier, um, we may have been able to deter this war, but we didn't. Um, and, and I guess that's really what it comes down to for me. Um, those who know my work know that I've spent a lot of time pushing for the recognition of corruption as a national security threat. Um, something that we succeeded at, actually, um, the, the year be before the full-scale invasion, um, you know, the president finally uh, recognized corruption as a core national security interest of the United States uh, in December 2021, just months before the full-scale invasion. Um, the first ever U.S. strategy on countering corruption was published, which is just an enormous, you know, accomplishment. And then prior to all of this, of course, Congress led the way with the establishment of the caucus against foreign corruption and kleptocracy. And in any case, we had been trying so hard <laughs> to 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 help the West recognize this, um, that all of what Dr. Grigas was saying that, you know, they were pushing this corruption to our systems via malign finance, via misinformation, and so on and so forth, to ensure that um, the many, many, many different warning signs of this, and, and many went way beyond warning signs, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, the initial invasion of Ukraine in 2014, the abuse of Interpol uh, over and over and over again, assassinations in the UK, assassinations in Berlin, uh, possible assassinations in Washington, uh, election interference all over the place. I mean, I mean, you know, it's extraordinary what we missed, and we didn't so much miss it as decide it wasn't important enough to sacrifice the economic and financial relationships that we had with Russia and that we have with China. So it's it's very wise, again, Dr. Grigas, to point out that this is a global geopolitical competition that China is supporting Russia, and and uh, you know I. I think there is still a, some kind of erroneous make-believe notion that China may play some role as some kind of negotiator. I mean, that's not real. Um, and, you know, we need to recognize that uh, in the post-February 24th world, this split between autocracy, an autocratic world and democratic world is has happened, you know? Um, and I, I guess I also want to recognize that because of our failure, because of the failure of deterrence uh, against Russia, um, this invasion happened. And then we all kind of assumed that this would lead to this three-day um, conquest of, of Ukraine. And we would have been ready to accept that. Um, and we were actually ready to lose. I mean, the United States went to <laughs> President Zelensky and said, you know, we're ready to get you out of here. Um, at which point, you know, President Zelensky said, no, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition, which is, you know, again, just kind of showing to us, you know, what it means to fight and stand for the values that we claim to believe in. Um, and we really needed that. And I, and I think everything that followed, the sanctions that followed, the arms that followed, everything that followed was a product of this notion that, oh, my God, Ukraine is actually going to stand and fight and has stood and fought um, and has showed us all how it's done. And in fact, probably thwarted uh, an invasion of Taiwan, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, which very likely would have followed the conquest of Ukraine. Uh, a testing of NATO would have followed the conquest of Ukraine. We may have had to, you know, then follow through with our Article 5 commitments and so on and so forth. Um, and we would be in a world war. So, I mean, something that I've said and I, I very much believe is Ukraine has already prevented a world war. Um, and the faster Ukraine wins this war, uh, the more likely we are to not end up in a world war. So long as this goes on, the risk remains. Um, so I, you know, we have pushed very, very strongly to get Ukraine what it needs to enhance sanctions and so on and so forth. Um, so I guess I want to say a word to uh, where we are on sanctions, since that's sanctions and corruption, since that's really what I, what I work on. Um, and and we can talk about everything else, but but I think that sanctions are are, are of interest and what I've been asked to speak about. So um, the sanctioned response to this uh, started very 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 weak when you know there was the the threat of invasion, the failure to sanction anyone prior to the invasion was a was a huge problem. I mean there were a number of problems with uh, the failure of deterrence, including you know various 
statements of, oh, well, we we definitely won't put troops in Ukraine. And so, I mean, just a constant, you know, signaling of what we wouldn't do to protect Ukraine, um, which is, which was a problem. After the Ukrainians demonstrated uh, their incredible capability and the defense of Kiev, um, the sanctions response is very strong, actually, for for a couple of weeks, particularly um, the sanctions on oligarchs, which you know we've been pushing for for the longest time. The the various task forces that have been formed now. There's the Klepto Capture Task Force in the U.S., the Kleptocracy Office in the U.K., Freeze and Seize Task Force in the EU. They're all united by this Russian elites, oligarchs, elites, proxies, and oligarchs. The the Repo Task Force of all these guys together, um, who have recently you know made some progress. I mean, it's one problem is that this is this is long progress. It's hard to go after these guys. It really is. Um, but there was the indictment of Deripaska, uh, you know, the initial seizure of all these uh, yachts and penthouses and so on and so forth, although nothing has been forfeited yet. Um, and we can go into maybe a question answer, maybe later, whatever you like, Michael, talk about getting some of that money to Ukraine, which is another thing that I work on. Um, but with regard to the sanctions, one of the great innovations and one of the things that I think we've only ever really used on Iran before, but we used on Russia, was the freezing of uh, reserves, which was really exciting uh, because there was this, you know, fear of, of Putin's war chest for the longest time that he could, you know, inject this money back into the economy, thereby, you know, preventing sanctions from doing damage. Um, but we just froze it. <laughs> We just froze 600 billion in reserves in the European Central Bank and in the in the New York Federal Reserve, uh, and that money's just sitting there. One of the big discussions now is: can we then confiscate that money? We've done this uh, once before, uh, to my knowledge, with regard to Afghanistan, uh, where we took the Afghan sovereign assets and then tried to push them back in for humanitarian aid. Although they ended up, I think, paying um, for 9/11 victims rather. But 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 you know, there's. There's a whole discussion around this now that's really exciting because, you know, one of the things is, I mean, overall, we spent about 60 billion on on assistance to Ukraine, only about like 20 billion of which is really actually assistance to Ukraine. A lot of this is fortifications for NATO and so on and so forth. Um, so 300 billion is a lot. <laughs> and I mean, 600 billion is a, a whole lot. Um, and, and, and that wouldn't be any taxpayer money. I mean, we could just take Russia, make Russia pay. Uh, and that's not even counting. Uh, the Russian oligarch assets. Now, the big failure of sanctions, the really major failure, has been in in, in oil and gas. Uh, obviously, gas. You know, the, the the European Union, Germany in particular, kept purchasing gas up until kind of the bitter end, uh, when when and and it was giving a billion you know euros a day to Russia. And and Russia's war chest is now really significant thanks to that. Now, this is this has since stopped uh, for the large part because. Russia's kind of decided that they're going to, you know, pursue the strategy of trying to freeze Russia, uh, freeze Europe out um, this 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 winter. And they blew up. I mean, it appears who who did this? Um, they they blew up the the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and, and, and major parts of Nord Stream pipeline. Um, you know, they've been they've been trying to push the Germans into a into breaking the sanctions regime and in some cases have succeeded. Um, you know, in particular in this very interesting turbine case where they got the Canadians, they got the Americans to put pressure on the Canadians to violate sanctions, to give it back to Germany, which then tried to give it back to Russia, at which point Russia said, oh, well, we don't actually need the turbine. It was a very, it was a very interesting set of circumstances where Russia just once again wanted to prove that the West was weak and the West would violate its own sanctions regime. Um, now there's this oil cap in place. And I know this is something else that, you know, Dr. Grigas pays attention to, but, um, uh, which Saudi Arabia then promptly broke <laughs> through 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 cutting the oil supply. I mean, it's it's really a, a a fascinating set of dynamics, but it's been very disastrous ultimately because oil and gas has effectively, you know, enabled Russia to reduce um, the damage that would otherwise have been uh, imposed by these sanctions because that's. The goal of our sanctions now, right? I mean, we've gone, it's the goal of the military assistance too. We've gone beyond um behavioral change, right? There's there's theories behind sanctions, and we often talk about sanctions in terms of, oh, we're changing Putin's behavior. We're not changing Putin's behavior anymore. We don't care. I mean, you know, what we're trying to do with sanctions is reduce the capacity of Russia to kill Ukrainians. 
that's 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 basically what it amounts to at this point. We are trying to reduce the capacity of the Russian war machine, which is fundamentally different than than the way we've looked at sanctions in the past. And in all honesty, it's the way that I've always kind of seen sanctions. I mean, when we think about sanctions on Cuba, Iran, North Korea, so on and so forth, people often argue that these sanctions have failed. I don't I don't believe they failed. I believe they've reduced the capacity of these states to do damage throughout the world. Our great mistake kind of to bring this all full circle to the point of democracies and autocracies was the integration of Russia, was the integration of China, was this, you know, greedy, uh, ignorant belief that through economic integration, we could democratize these places when in fact, democracy does not move in that order. It does not work like that. It is a struggle every day to defend democracy. Uh, and that's something that we are recognizing again now. So, um, you know, there's there's many people that want to, you know, there's there's many different forces that want to find a way to kind of return to normal, particularly in light of, um, you know, Ukrainian, the incredible Ukrainian counteroffensives. There's kind of so, OK, well, Ukraine's defended itself now and, you know, we can do these negotiations or give some part of I mean, that's obviously ridiculous and would only um, lead to the renewal of hostilities. I mean, you know. Our position has been, you know, complete Ukrainian victory, the return to 91, you know, 1991 sovereign borders and, and you know, the isolation of Russia for as long as it takes and the support of Ukraine for as long as it takes um, until this war is won, um, which is which is the only thing in the long term that will deter Russia and deter China and deter dictators generally. So um, I guess I'll leave it there and we can get into all sorts of other questions around you know, money and sanctions and, and, and all that good stuff. Um, Paul, Dr. Grigas, um, thank you very much um, for uh, excellent presentations. Um, frankly speaking, I have taken a lot of notes and I have a feeling our audience uh, members as well have taken a lot of notes because I see lots of questions already that are coming into the Q&A uh, function below. But as moderator, I, I'd like to kind of start the start the discussion with with kind of combining both of your thoughts um, in, 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 in phrasing the question or phrasing or, or looking forward to where do we go from here. I, I'm, I'm looking at what, what uh, Dr. Griegas had mentioned in terms of, of, of re-imperialization. I think these, these terms are absolutely necessary to comprehend um, we need to understand what it what it means, um, but we also have to to, to understand what, what what does that signify or what does that what does that prove for the future? One of the things in terms of our policy forums that we've been having in the past several months, especially since the war in Ukraine, is the term decolonization has actually started to be to to be used quite often now. Um, Paul had mentioned this that that if American policy experts, uh, Dr. Grigas, you mentioned, um, if American uh, policy experts, um, administration officials had listened to your grandmother or had listened to us, we'd be in a totally different world right now. How do we not, to put it bluntly and to put it very um, uh, succinctly, how do we not therefore repeat the past, the mistakes of the past in moving forward? We already know that sanctions work and not necessarily always the, to the best of the abilities though. And I'll give you a prime example. Prime example for me, I was, I was quite um, shocked that the United States government after the four um, oblasts, the four regions in Ukraine were illegally annexed by the Russian Federation several weeks ago, immediately the State Department issued its sanctions on hundred members of the Russian Duma. Well, frankly speaking, I would have thought that on February 25th of 2022, those 100 members of the Russian Duma would have been sanctioned. I would have thought as well that the chairperson of the National Bank of Russia would have been sanctioned on February 25th of 2022, not on September, whatever date that it was. So how do we, knowing everything that we know about the past eight months in Ukraine, how do we, knowing everything that we know in the past eight years of Ukraine, and knowing everything that we know about the past several centuries of Russian imperialism, how do we not repeat those mistakes in the in in, in the in the future? I'll leave it open ended. I'll start with with uh, 
with uh, Agnia, Agnia and then move over to Paul. Please, Dr. Grigas. You know, it's a very difficult question because in fact, um, you know, we do know and we have learned these lessons, but I think um, there are still a lot of individuals in, uh, in the foreign policy establishment and leadership positions that don't. And I think in some ways, it's also, if we can compare, let's say again, autocratic versus democratic systems, it's somewhat of a weakness in our democratic systems that we don't have that continuity. Um, with uh, election cycles, with our own domestic pol great political divides and division that we're experiencing today in this country. And even if we look back, we've, we've seen almost, you know, so many past American presidents coming into office saying that they will improve somehow relations with Russia, that somehow this will be different. You can go, can go back to, you know, George W., uh, who, you know, kind of thought he had that connection when he, I mean, you know, these are cliches now looked into the eyes of Vladimir Putin and so on. We had Hillary Clinton when she had the reset button. You know, we had uh, President Trump when he came in. Again, somehow he thought, you know, his personal skills will improve this relationship. So I think probably we're maybe for the first time with Biden, we have... Um, a leader in the White House who had already experienced, you know, who has been tried in some ways from his uh, previous experience as vice uh, president, um, having this, you know, very already the realities of that relationship with Russia without probably coming in with hopes to improve this. But, you know, again, I feel like we keep, uh, you know, falling, I don't know what's the expression, you know, stepping on the same something twice or falling in the same ditch uh, endless times. I think it's really uh, the realization that's necessary that this is something also beyond um, some unique circumstances, whether it's Crimea, whether it's some unique circumstances as Russia tries to present it in Georgia, or let's say in the case of Moldova, Transnistria, that this truly is a global geopolitical contest, again, between democratic states and authoritarian states, autocratic states, and we can't assume that somehow we can just do business as usual, trade as usual, um, you know, and uh, just think about, I don't know, profits and so on without looking at that um, broader picture and the true intents of uh, countries to frankly weaken us, weaken um, the United States, weaken our society, divide us further. So well, let me, uh, let me, um, let me try to express something here. So I, I actually, don't lay the blame with the elected politicians. And I think for the most part, actually, our electoral system gets, you know, I mean, the, the, the best of American foreign policy is generally comes out of the elected politicians. I mean, when you look at like the human rights, anti-corruption, all that stuff generally comes out of Congress. The problem is really more the great power politics expert community that in, the, in sort of the Russianist community that generally sort of looks at global politics and sees kind of these empires that have to do business together because it's all about who's strong and, you know, the, the kind of Thucydides, like, you know, uh, you know, the strong do what they can and the weak do as they must, you know, and, and, that, and that's kind of, that's kind of where they live. Um, and that's why we keep hitting the same problems because we've got this kind of path dependency in our policy. When we look at Russia, you know, we don't really see this you know, imperial empire that we see, we see the USSR, you know, we see, we see Moscow, you know, I mean, so many of, of what the people that have, that are advising and that, and that are writing the memos and that are writing the pieces, you know, um, in, in, in DC and that have kind of the ear of the people that have the ear of the president and so on and so forth. These individuals have listened to Valdai, Moscow. They've been, they've been, when they, when they look east, they see Moscow. When Berlin looks east, they see Moscow, right? I mean, these, these kind of groups, these countries in between, these, you know, these, these Poles and these Ukrainians and these both, they just screw it up for everybody. Why can't they just, you know, keep to themselves and, you know, sort of do what they're told by the great powers? And why do they insist on sovereignty and whatever, you know, it's like, so, so, this needs to change. And that and that's why the decolonial perspective is so important because it challenges the overarching kind of IR perspective of great power politics. It effectively says, 
No, you need to listen to the voices within Russia that make up the empire. You need to view Russia as as the Russian empire, essentially, as the long fall of the Russian empire. A hundred years, you know, like a hundred years later, the Bolsheviks, you know, keep it going for a little while. They embrace fascism and so on and so forth. And they eventually, you know, Russia never has its kind of Germany moment where democracy is shoved down its throat like we did with Germany. <laughs> you know, I mean, Russia has done zilch, nothing to come to terms with the past you know, the, the many, many, many different evils that Russia has done to its neighbors and to its ethnic minorities and to its, you know, and to white Russians and 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 so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's, you know, this, this Russian state is utterly unapologetic. Um, it's totally imperial. Um, and that's, that's why this kind of decolonial perspective is so new. It's like, okay, wait, let's listen to, you know, the, 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 the people, the, the peoples within Russia, the captive nations within Russia. Let's listen to those peoples who have been seen as Russian colonies, like the Baltic states, like the Ukrainians, like the Poles. Let's let's listen to their experience and understand it from their perspective. And then when you do that, you're like, oh, this is actually how Russia operates. And you start getting a much clearer perspective and a much more real perspective on how Russia operates rather than listening to kind of Moscow. So, I mean, it, it, it's tough. It's it's hard to walk away from that. And you have to retrain the entire expert community basically that does the advising in DC, but we're really doing our best. I, I, think, the, I think the new generation of experts will not, I mean, it's just the facts on the ground have fundamentally changed, right? I mean, like how can you see Russia as a great power after this? I mean, they've been defeated by I mean, they've effectively been defeated by Ukraine. So, I mean, like, you know, how can you see them as a, as great Russia after this anyway, just in pure power politics terms? To that to that extent, it, this is this is the fight of of democracy versus authoritarianism. Obviously, the examples of of everybody throughout the world of author, uh, authoritarian governments and autocrats looking at what's happening in Ukraine and deciding on their grand chessboard, uh, what's our next particular move? You know, in our prior uh, and previous um, uh, for policy forums, we've had experts that actually have have, have been very blunt. Um, they've said that that Russia must be defeated um, in, in in Ukraine. Um, this is not just uh, appeasement for Russia. Um, that we, as the Western world now, as the as the global community of democracies. Um, somehow we'll come to, to, to some offset, to some deal with Russia, um, and we can't be intimidated by Russia anymore. Paul, to your point, exactly to your point. But how do we take it, um, Paul, this, this may be specifically to you in terms of sanctions. We, we, we've known that sanctions have been affected, but, but not necessarily because the war obviously is continuing eight months, eight months later. Um, there's a question um, that's been posed in terms of um, increased trade that Russia has with India and with Brazil. Um, hasn't that necessarily offset all of the Western democracy um, democracies sanctions against the Russian war machine? So it really hasn't offset it. I mean, um, to replace Europe as a market for Russia is extremely difficult. I mean, you know, this was always kind of the theory was like, wow, we actually have a lot of leverage over these guys. You know, we should we should recognize that we have leverage, that they rely on us uh, as we rely on them. I mean, I I think the it's just more embarrassing for India and Brazil that they're unable to recognize exactly what we're talking about here, that this is a global conflict between um, democracies and autocracies. Um, And they and, you know, I mean, it's. It, there's nothing really more embarrassing than than kind of these countries that have a decolonial perspective. Like, I mean, India's politics is just shot through with a decolonial perspective, and yet they can't seem to grasp that Russia is an empire and a colonial state. And this is a large part because of Russia obf- Russian obfuscation and you know the 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 incredible trick over decades of the USSR disguising itself and using the language of decolonization in order to pursue empire. I mean, really the hiding the Russian empire in communism has got to be one of the the great kind of like tricks of history, right? I mean, like it, it has it has fooled and continues to fool um, numerous 
African nations, India, Brazil, so on and so forth. And, and, and this notion that to oppose kind of American-led capitalism is to be pro-Russia is just unbelievable and demonstrates an extremely deep ignorance. Uh, but, but, but again, a mentality that's very much shaped in the Cold War, right? And, and, the fact that, and the fact that this Cold War mentality has not left Brazil, has not left India, and has not left DC. And that's why we're still, I mean, we're, we're struggling to do the right thing in DC, and some of us are, but I mean, we, it really is a struggle. I mean, Ukraine still doesn't have attack of us, you know? I mean, Ukraine's still, like, we're still constantly hand-wringing about escalation and all this other stuff that just, like, doesn't make sense in the current context, you know? Um, so, so, I mean, we all are struggling with the legacy of, of the Cold War. I mean, I mean, in one sense, no one more so than Russia, right? I mean, I mean, the, I mean what, you know, I mean, if, if any, if any single country lives with the legacy of cold, the Cold War, it's, it's Russia that's trying to rebuild the empire, you know? So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll follow up with that specifically sure, please, please. on, um, you know, energy and Russia and India. So uh, indeed, as Paul said, it's very difficult for Russia to immediately replace the European market. I mean, frankly, the Europeans have, paying, have been paying, buying the largest volumes and paying the highest prices, you know, for decades. And really that dependency goes back to the Cold War era, including with all the infrastructure that is there. So Russia ha itself has sought to, pivot towards the Asian markets for now, um, you know, this has been in, the, in their works, in their, you know, policy agenda for maybe 10, 15 years. But the fact is they don't have sufficient infrastructure to do that. Uh, what has uh, helped them uh, just for now, while they haven't be, been able to offset the volumes, uh, the very high price environment has, uh, you know, made it essentially, even when they're selling lower volumes, they're making more money than they did, you know, before the war. So that's a major issue, the very high um, oil and gas price environment right now, which I would like to see, you know, frankly, more action uh, on, on the U.S. side. Uh, the United States is now the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. It's an energy superpower. And frankly, I mean, I you know, wrote about this, spoke about this. This is really time to flex these muscles for the United States. Um, certainly renewables are the future, but um, the fossil fuel muscle is here today and it should be flexed in this time of crisis. When we look at India specifically, you know, for me, it's a little, you know, India is a, kind of a democracy, right? In, in name um, and in practice, but again, uh, maybe some of the leanings of this current government, some of those uh, political relationships that had been established um, between Delhi and you know, Moscow. And I think India remains this kind of major swing state in this current um, geopolitical contest. So for me, it's very interesting to, well, interesting. Um, you know, I think it's very strategically important which way um, India is going to turn in the end. And I think that's also a relationship that's very important for Washington to uh, cultivate further. Well, um, to, 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 to continue on this, so as we're, we're, we're talking about the war in Ukraine, and obviously there are many aspects I can have an entire afternoon with, with the both of you to discuss the war in Ukraine. We're also talking about transatlantic security, and and obviously, um, Dr. Grigas, in terms of of uh, the energy factor um, within energy security, but there's also um, a country to Ukraine's north uh, called Belarus, um, and 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 obviously we've seen what's happened since since 2020 um, in Belarus. There's a question um, that's been posed: What is the value of a free Belarus to the Western community, and is there any type of ideal scenario? under which Belarus can break its ties with Russia. If we're discussing re-imperialization, it's it, obviously it's not just the, the imperialist state of what the Russian Federation is right now as an empire, but obviously what they're trying to do in Ukraine and, and uh, what they've tried to do for the longest time in, in controlling Belarus. So uh, maybe Dr. Grigas, if, if you'd like to answer that question. I think, unfortunately, today Belarus is a captured state. I don't view it as an independent state in, you know, in any sense um, as it is today. 
And under various, you know, guises, um, Russia has gained control of it. Uh, of course, with the pretext of, you know, the cultural ties or, you know, Russian speaking population with various, um, you know, corruption schemes. And, you know, frankly, just, the, um, you know, Lukashenko, who is today, you know, pretty much under the thumb of the Kremlin. Um, because of the, you know, the opposition movements uh, since uh, 2020, but, you know, frankly, a lot of those opposition uh, individuals, leaders, they are no longer in, I mean, if they're in Belarus, they're in jail, or they have fled the country. Uh, the public has been, uh, I think, uh, just suffered tremendously. I mean, they saw, they faced tremendous brutality uh, in the hands of the police, the secret services in, um, in Belarus. So, I think they did, you know, the public did what they could. They tried to have their kind of gut transition and revolution, but um, essentially it's been squashed. So I think today Belarus's future is very much tied to the future of, you know, the Kremlin. And I think if we'll see, you know, Russia defeated in this war in Ukraine, we'll see a free Belarus uh, or, you know, much more likely to see a free Belarus. And, and then that's why we have the uh, Belarusian volunteers, frankly, fighting in uh, in Ukraine because of that very clear understanding that this is their fight, you know, very much directly their fight as well. Paul, well, anything you'd like to add? Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Okay, agree. The, the, thank you, thank you. Um, again, when it comes to transatlantic, we 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 know where France and we know where Germany have been at least in the last. Prior to, to February 24th of 2022, when it, when it truly was um, trying to appease Moscow to, to the best of their abilities and, and leaving uh, Ukraine out to dry, or frankly speaking, leaving Ukraine in the cold, literally. Um, last week, we know that, that, that Schultz visited Paris. Um, we know that he met with Macron. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question, if you could talk about the differences in those two countries, defense and energy policies, especially as it uh, as it refers to, um, to, to to Russia right now and the war in Ukraine, Paul. Yeah. So, boy, I mean, these German are not, these are not easy questions that we have for for. <laughs> for no, you. no. I mean, they're they're really they're really good questions. They're important questions. I guess I guess it's just you know to be to be frank. I mean, there would be no full scale invasion of Ukraine if not for Germany. I mean, I mean, Germany basically for twenty years has been pursuing a policy driven by Russian strategic corruption and co option of German elites. Um, you know, beginning with the co option of Gerhard Schroeder while he was still in office, going through Merkel going through Steinmeier all the way up to Schultz. I mean, I mean, and, you know, it, it, Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2 are both products of corruption. Um, the German economy was built to be reliant and on Russia and then China, actually, also, because the notion was, I mean, Germany's economy um, is the only one in, in Europe that has maintained this middle manufacturing um, you know, sector because they they sort of cheated, right? <laughs> they 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 were bringing in cheap gas, or corrupt gas from 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 Russia, and then they were building, and then they were selling to China. You know, so I mean, they they've effectively made themselves fully dependent on authoritarian regimes, and I mean, it's just like it doesn't come to as a, any surprise to anybody here, right? I mean, this is this is the fundamental problem is we were pointing this out for like a decade. <laughs> You know, just like this is going to blow up in your face. It's going to blow up in your face. It's going to blow up in everybody's face, you know, and then it did. And there's been almost no heads of role, no responsibility has been taken. Nothing is, I mean, it's just like, and, and even now there's hand wringing. Even now Schultz is considering selling parts of Hamburg port to the Chinese and selling chip makers to the Chinese. It's like, it's like nothing has been learned. I mean, I, I mean, the French are, no better, right? I mean, they 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 have a di they have different strategic dependencies, and and in some sense, you know, they're 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 more conscious of their dependencies. Like like Germany's, I think, and in, in are are part of are significantly more part of elite capture and corruption. Whereas I get the feeling that the French, like they they kind of like the notion of counterbalancing, and you know, here we'll sell a few arms to the Russians, and we'll sell a few, you know, just you know, just in case something happens, you know, I mean, you know, so. I mean, the, the French have always kind of had this notion of, 
you know, well, America, eh, we want to be the real military power and maybe we should have this strategic autonomy and, you know, kind of is European army and kind of get NATO out of Europe and all that kind of stuff. So they've had kind of this more this this we want to control the European military apparatus, whereas Germany, um, you know, really made Europe strategically dependent on Russia. And without that strategic dependency, no way would 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 Russia. I mean, I mean, after the original 2014 invasion, it's only after that that Nord Stream 2 was built. Absolutely. Like, like, I mean, I mean, it's just it's so 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 has it gotten better? You know, not really. I think that I think the Germans right now are the Zeitenwende is not is not really real in the in the way that people wanted it to be. I mean, I think Schultz really pro- over promised, under delivered. Um, and I think the Germans are kind of deer in the headlights. I think they, they, you know, they, they don't really know what to do. Their economic model is falling apart. I mean, it's falling apart no matter which way you go. I mean, unless, unless somehow, I mean, there's those that want to go back to business as usual with Russia, but that's in reality, that's not going to happen because the Ukrainians simply are never going to let it happen. I mean, the Ukrainians aren't going to roll over now. I mean, it's, you know, so it's just like, so, so Germany's in this space where it's hard for them to accept reality which is that Russia's way weaker, is going to be isolated, you know, is not what they thought it was or what they dreamed it was or what they were corrupted to believe it was and so on and so forth. Um, so, I mean, the sooner Russia, the sooner the sooner Germany confronts reality and kind of squares the circle and realizes that its place is with the democracies and not playing some Zondervik, Mittelage, you know, oh, we're, we're the, we're the country between the big countries. We're between America and Russia and China. And we counterbalance. As, as so, the sooner Germany and France give up these notions of counterbalancing, which were always silly, and they were under different names, strategic autonomy, Mittel, Mittelage, Zondervik, all that kind of crap. The, the sooner all that's given up and they just say we're on the side of democracy, the better off we all are, because that's where they are. I mean, the notion that they were ever going to really deeply align themselves with China was always silly because China has no interest in individual rights. They have no interest in, you know, allowing Europe to have its freedoms that it so enjoys, you know. Um, anyway. Um, Dr. Grigas, any, any, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with everything. And if you look at energy policy in particular, um, I mean, right before the invasion, uh, literally in the start, the early days of February, I was giving a talk and it was, um, um, you know, there were some on the energy policy in particular in Europe. And, you know, I frankly called, uh, German energy policy impotent. And again, I received some flack for that. And, you know, look, and of course, I would reiterate that word, you know, the, the probably the best word to describe it. If we look at Germany, Germany has been Russia's largest customer in Europe in terms of gas. I mean, number one gas from customer and the country that has uh, announced that they're going to make a, you know, this green transition and so on. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous that up until now they had and they did not build any LNG import terminals. They made no efforts to diversify. It's just nonsensical. I mean, frankly, nonsensical um, and either complete impotence or just uh, pure, pure corruption can only explain their energy policy choices. And again, you know, I mean, I can also share, you know, I was in Germany speaking to energy executives there and even the energy executives were saying, you know, like to build Nord Stream 2, that's just a political decision. It just makes no sense in the actual energy realities on the ground in Europe and the, you know, the the transition, the hopes, the possibility. I mean, in any sense, it just doesn't make any sense. It's pretty much just a political decision. So, but I think another element here, I want to highlight that how long the Europeans and frankly, the Americans have uh, just, uh, you know, taken it this incredible level of corruption where so many top leaders, uh, you know, former prime ministers, chancellors, foreign ministers from, you know, Germany, France, Austria, beyond, just after they are done with office, they go work for Russian state energy companies. I mean, there's a roster of them and there has been, there have been no consequences for them whatsoever. And, you know, I find that extraordinary, um, extraordinary that uh, the European Union, NATO has, um, 
you know, just uh, openly watch this uh, extraordinary level of corruption going on. And I just, that's, that's, that's exactly, I just wanted to add real quick because that's exactly right. And uh, it's, it's like a pyramid, right? I mean, the, what we see at the top, the tippy top is, is just the very tip of the iceberg of the massive corruption. The further down you go, like, I mean, the German gas ministry, the foreign ministry, almost totally co-opted. I mean, I mean, to the point that all of them expect jobs in various Russian industries and lobbying shops and so on and so forth afterward. Um, I mean, this is this has been the trend with the West. I mean, authoritarian states figured out you can just buy former officials, which means that when they are officials, they'll do what you say in the hopes of landing that lucrative job afterward. So when it comes to Germany and and and, and France, obviously we, we we know where they've been. We know about the corrupt officials that that are are working hand in hand. Uh, with Russian corrupt uh, uh, officials as well. But who's really stepped up, at least in the past eight months, if not even the past eight years, are some of the Central and East European um, uh, countries, neighbors of Ukraine, the Baltics, Poland, and so forth. Uh, there's a question um, that's been posed. Can you say a few words about their assistance um, um, to Ukraine? Uh, what has it meant for Ukrainians on the battlefield? And frankly speaking, I, I, I think mostly, what is it meant for, for Ukraine's morale as well? Mm -hmm. So I think the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, they have stepped up and they have set precedents when the larger countries dallied and debated and couldn't, you know, and feared to, to make a stance. And I, we've seen that consistently in every way from, you know, Lithuania, let's say, announcing that they will not buy any Russian gas immediately. And while the you know a lot of the European powers still debated, is that feasible? Oh, that's not possible. That's unrealistic, and so on. Well, I don't know. It's realistic for Poland. It's realistic for Lithuania, countries that ten years ago were a hundred percent dependent on Russian gas. Uh, so how is that unrealistic for you know countries who have maybe let's say a thirty percent dependency on Russian gas? How is it unrealistic for them to stop uh, those purchases? We've seen it again from the weapons uh, immediately. Uh, not being afraid that this will be somehow a provocation or, you know, or, you know, detrimental to relations with Russia and so on. So I think that has, and also call, you know, political statements, I mean, calling Russia a terrorist state and, and so on. Um, I think all of these have um, allowed to set that precedent. And then it allowed, I would say, the bigger countries to kind of think that over <laughs> and follow suit. Um, so I think it's been incredibly important, incredibly valuable, and they've truly been the vanguard in this fight against Russia. Because frankly, you know, they know they're next. I mean, this is about, you know, existential security for them. If uh, uh, Ukraine was to be overrun by Russia in, you know, those three days or however, three months, whatever it would have been, I think that would have just only whet the appetite for the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, um, to, to answer that, I give you an opportunity to answer this question as well, but with a little bit of a pretext here. Um, I personally followed your travels um, in Ukraine and Central Europe um, during the summertime. Um, I Every time I got onto Twitter, there was always a story from, from Paul Massaro, where he was, who he met with, um, and, and, and just the scope and the breadth of the individuals and officials that you met with. So maybe give us a little bit of perspective of your travels um, to the region, uh, obviously to Ukraine and to, to Poland and to other countries and how they've helped the war effort in Ukraine. Yeah, so I, I guess, I, you know, I had this wonderful opportunity to, to travel Ukraine. And I went, I went in twice um, actually. And I, you know, I, I met the extraordinary volunteers like Come back alive and Pratula the Charity Foundation and 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 others the the Georgian Legion guys and others that are that are you know I, I mean I mean the effort there is extraordinary I mean I I I don't think I need to tell anybody I mean Ukraine is totally determined to win this war every single individual everyone's giving you know you're either fighting or you're giving your last dime you're I mean in in some way you are working to ensure that Ukraine will win the war and I mean you talk you talk with Ukrainians and it's like absolutely fearless it's kind of like uh, so what if you what if russia uses a nuclear weapon and they're like what of it <laughs> you know i mean it's just it's just really a uh a, 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 an incredible thing and an incredible commitment to freedom um you know i went 
I went on my own dime because, you know, I mean, the United States is is not uh, currently allowing, you know, any sort of official delegation beyond a particular below a particular level. And of course, I'm, you know, not a senator, senator or representative or or, or the president or anything like that. Um, so uh, in any case, I, I had the chance to meet a president, though. I, I, I actually got in with President Zelensky and and um, and was able to speak with him about, in fact, you know, getting these Russian reserves and stuff like that. Um, but I guess for me, February 24th is when we discovered what people are made of. And, and and it's when the chips are down that you know who your real allies are. Um, and I think it it revealed after 30 years, you know, who's going to stand with us when the worst happens and who's going to stand for democracy and who's going to put their all into fighting autocracy. And I mean, Ukraine, obviously, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, I want to talk about, but I mean, I mean, Ukraine itself is making the, the greatest sacrifice for the free world right now by a mile. I mean, there's no comparison. I, I don't think any country's made any similar sacrifice since World War II, probably. I mean, it, it's 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 really extraordinary the extent to which um, Ukraine is giving its all of its blood and all of its treasure uh, to protect itself, of course, and its own independence and sovereignty and democracy. But I mean, you know, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> I mean, I mean, they're they're defending everyone. Um, now. I have been blown away by the Polish and Baltic response in particular. I mean, the Czechs and Slovaks have been extraordinary as well. Um, the Finns have been great. I mean, the the Poles as as leaders, though, especially given the you know the size of the country. I mean, the the Baltic states obviously it's it's wonderful. Like Latvia gave like fifty percent of its. I mean, all of them are like in half their military budgets going to Ukraine, basically. Um, the 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 com the comparable size makes it a little tougher. Whereas like Poland is 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 quite large, you know. Um. So I mean, giving all of your tanks and everything is, you know, is just is just extraordinary. And just I mean, Poland mobilized like Ukraine mobilized. All like it's like you know every single poll is like, oh yeah, we got to defeat Russia. Ukraine's got to win the war, you know. Um. Whereas then you get to Germany and it's like, well, I don't know, you know, maybe we should talk about it. And I can't believe we can't talk to the Russians anymore and all that, you know, it's so, but, but I mean, to me, the commitment shown by Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Finland, and, and, you know, I mean, the Northern, the Northern European states have also been Sweden, you know, I mean, um, that's where I see the future of U.S. alliances. Um, and, and that's because, you know, we should recognize that Russia is going to lose this war and Russia will be isolated and Russia, you know, will face incredible internal difficulties that, you know, lead to a transformation of Russia. I don't know what that's going to look like, but there's going to be some transformation of Russia. I hope it ends up in some form of freedom for the Russian people and the captive nations of Russia. But I mean, so much of that's going to be beyond our power fundamentally. Um, but Russia in many ways will cease to be the threat it's been because Russian capacity has been wildly reduced to cause problems all around the world. I mean, I, I often think like Syria, North Africa, Venezuela, China, Iran, like mm -hmm. they're gonna be so much less capable of screwing around with the whole world thanks to Ukraine, basically, you know? Um, so it's, and, that, and that's a wonderful thing for the world. Um, but I mean, the long-term challenge is of course, Chinese designs on earth. <laughs> You know, and the and the, and their their vision of replacing, uh, 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 you know, the a general international consensus toward human rights and democracy with a general international consensus toward authoritarianism and a surveillance state. You know, which is which is their, you know, their vision. And 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 in that struggle, you know, I believe that it's the Central and Eastern European states, minus Hungary, which you know has yeah. been a really, really, really big problem for, you know, some reason. <laughs> um, but but uh will will play a major, major role uh in that struggle. And I and I, and it's been ex really exciting, you know, because it because it is, I think, what Dr. Griega said that that they're next, but it's also because the recent memory of totalitarian authoritarianism is there. Right. So so every single one of these countries know what it means 
to actually live under authoritarianism. And nobody in the West knows that anymore. And the kids in the West, are, I mean, some of them even flirt with authoritarianism now because, you know, well, you know, we got to defeat our political opponents and whatever else. And maybe authoritarianism wouldn't be so bad. Whereas nobody says that in that region. You know, I mean, the Ukrainians, every Ukrainian my age is fighting and dying for their country in order not to live under authoritarianism. I cannot say the same about my generation here. So we have about 10 minutes left um, and, and there are quite a few questions. There are three in particular that I want to get to, but I want to follow up immediately uh, on your comments about the Central and East European um, countries. The, the, it's, it's not just in terms of the material assistance that they've given Ukraine, whether it's, it's security assistance, weaponry, humanitarian assistance. It's also the, their political will. Um, and their political will, um, I, I, I think we've seen in terms of their governments um, designating and recognizing Russia as a terrorist state, as a state sponsor of terrorism. Now, PACE also came out, the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, they also came out with their resolution. It was good. Um, I think it was a little watered down, but it, it, it was a step in the right direction. Wh where do you see Washington in terms of this fundamental question of recognizing Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism. I know this has been the, the ongoing discussion for the past eight, eight, eight months at least. Uh, my community has been saying this for the longest time, um, even prior to that. But you have a terrorist state that's designated by the United States, that being the state of Iran, that's now supplying guided missiles and obviously drones to be used in Ukraine. So how do we equate that with Russia that's not uh, designated as a state sponsor of terror. Paul, I'll start with you and then sure. Dr. Vigas. Sure. I mean, well, well, is there a more obvious terrorist state than Russia? I mean, I mean, you, you can even compare it to the other. I mean, Cuba is a terrorist state, right? I mean, like, like the, you know, and, and, and rightfully so, but I mean, like, like it, it, it it's just unbelievable, you know, uh, uh, looking at Russian actions and Russian terrorism and, and to not designate it. But I mean, this comes down to, I think, two considerations. One is, you know, the, the, the U.S. designation would require and necessitate secondary sanctions, which would then likely hit various European companies, because, of course, Europe has not totally stopped business with Russia. Um, I mean, some of the stuff's been stopped, but I mean, up until the bitter end, it wasn't, it wasn't the Europeans, it wasn't the Germans that stopped buying Russian gas, it was Russia that stopped selling it, you know, I mean, and, and I mean, it was, it, to this day, German businesses are still active in Russia. I mean, they're still, I mean, it's, you know, the, and, and because of that, there's this kind of this concern that this designation would possibly get in the way of this kind of transatlantic solidarity and this notion of like keeping the G7 together and all that kind of stuff to, to continue supporting Ukraine. Um, and then, and then the other, I mean, you know, I, I don't buy these concerns, but I'm just explaining them. But then, but then the other thing is, you know, the, the designation of Russia as a terrorist state would effectively downgrade Russia from great power forever. I mean, I mean, the it, and that's in some sense why the Ukrainians want it. And I get that. Um, and I want it because of that reason, too. I mean, but it's but recognize that it's kind of what I was saying before about this notion of like this obsession with Russia as a great power, this obsession with talking to Moscow, all that kind of stuff and whatever else. If you did this you've effectively crossed the Rubicon into Russia is a rogue state. It is, <laughs> you know, Russia is a weak state. It is. Russia is nothing more than a Cuba, a North Korea, uh, you know, an, an Iran and so on and so forth. Some place where the American goal is no longer engagement. It is no longer any sort of integration. It is purely isolation and capacity reduction. And, it, and 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 in my opinion, it should be like I think I think we're there, but but a lot of people in this town are not there yet. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Grigas. No, I agree, and uh, you know it's uh, it should be the case, but uh, you know will that political willpower be there? And then also maybe I would uh, kind of touching on some of the other points we made also. How long will our memory be? Um, and, you know, frankly, Paul, you've said a number of times, you know, everything changed post February 24th. You know, frankly, I mean, I would say I hope. I don't know if truly everything changed post February 24th um, because we've had these look. We've had 2014, we've had uh, 2008. I mean, we've had a number, a number of incidents here already. Well, incidents, you know, a number of uh, Russia's acts of aggression. I mean, we had the meddling in the 
um, the election. So we've had so many things happen. And then there are too many people, frankly, on a you know, broad variety of sides who still hope to forget and somehow just move forward, just to return to business as usual. And I think part of it may be also because of some of the strains that we're also facing in the United States, economic, uh, you know, so, uh, social, again, political divisions, and many other factors. So I think, um, you know, you have to be strong uh, domestically as well to take on this global geopolitical challenge. And that's another reality. How strong are we today in the United States as a society as well? That's that's right. I, I guess as an economy. I, I just want to I want to point out that, you know, American cleavages are American cleavages. They're homegrown, but our adversaries go to great lengths to exacerbate them. Absolutely. And and this has been an incredibly effective divide and rule sort of strategy. Um, and I mean, that's why we have bills right now, like the Enablers Act, which many people here know that would finally put sort of due diligence obligations on U.S. lawyers and accountants and so on and so forth that many of your groups have supported, you know, and and, and thank you for that and, and so on and so forth. Um and, 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 a, and a huge part, and this is why I say when we failed to fight kleptocracy and that led to this, we need to fight kleptocracy now. We need to get that blood money out of our system. We need to get the malign influence out of our system because we can handle the cleavages if they're not being constantly exacerbated and if they're not being constantly you know, blown up. You know, Democracy can handle cleavage. We've had cleavage for <laughs> since the beginning, you know, um, but we can't handle it if there's all this money being thrown into turning those into insurmountable obstacles. Lightning round, uh, last two questions. I'll, I'll, I'll group them together. So with Russia's recent announcement of the, the break with the Ukrainian grain deal, it's on again, off again, it seems to be back on again. Um, do you think that this will affect the resolve of the EU and other countries um, to continue sanctions against Russia? And mm -hmm. as we're speaking about Russia, what about internally in Russia? What is, is there any role um, for the Russian uh, populace um, and any of these matters that are happening within Russia itself. So we'll start with the sanctions, with the grain deal, and then we'll go into, into Russia. So I think, uh, well, with the grain deal, you, I mean, you can't trust Russia in, in, in this regard in, in any deal. Uh, frankly, I think they're just buying time and, uh, uh, you know, we're using this just as a, their own nefarious tactic. Um, to what extent... Um, Sorry, the second question. Uh, internally in Russia, what can the what internally in Russia exactly? In Russia, I'm Russia pretty pessimistic, uh, frankly, at also uh, to how ready is Russian society to take on change. Frankly, um, we if we look at the polls, if we look. I mean, it's been 20 years of propaganda, 20 years of trying to evoke within the Russian populace this desire for Russia's greatness, uh, rebuilding the empire, and so on. Uh, in fact, Putin has gone to war repeatedly, if you look at actually polls, when his popularity dipped. So he's uh, launched military campaigns in order to boost his popularity. Um, I mean, that's very telling in itself, and it worked for him every single time. I mean, I think maybe this time he really took it too far because, you know, frankly, the country is, I think, just falling apart and just can't handle this scale of a war. Um, but again, we've seen, you know, the Russians that have uh, decided to flee that rather than try to, you know, seek change in the country. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm rather honestly pretty pessimistic for the near term. Uh, Paul? I, I mean, I completely agree with the answer to the first question. So, I, I mean, I just, you can't trust Russia, Russia as far as you can throw them. I mean, it's kind of irrelevant. You know, the only thing you can do is defeat Russia in the field. And that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to do. You know, the best, what's that? The, the, the best way to negotiate with Russia is with Heimers. You know, <laughs> um, so, so uh, the, the, the second thing is I, I also am extremely pessimistic. I mean, I, I, I really do think that, you know, Again, Russia will just need to be totally defeated in Ukraine and 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 totally pushed back. And even then, uh, you know, I mean, who knows how long Putin's around? I don't I don't really anticipate. I mean, Putin being taken down by anything really, except one day, old age. You know, um, who knows? You know, but but I also don't think we need to necessarily focus on that. I mean, I I I think we can develop a new policy over here based on 
as we discussed decolonial perspectives and listening to you know central eastern europeans and and getting away from this and 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 really what we can what we can control we should focus on what we can control and what we can control is arming ukrainians sanctioning russia and getting our head straight on what russia is and what russia isn't you know and then move on from there and 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 not try to necessarily do all too much to impact what is going to happen in russia and what is not i mean in my mind russia is effectively a north korea style state now i mean i mean they the best thing we can do is isolate and focus on what we can control but but really isolate you know not 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 no integration you know um and we can control that we can decide and it's our sovereign decision to decide our sovereign decisions to decide who we trade with and who has access to our financial system mm-hmm. this is for us to decide you know and and we can make a decision that dictators don't get that Fantastic discussion. I, I, I don't know how to thank um, our panelists for truly uh, uh, an enlightening discussion. You've given us so much food for thought um, and a lot of good homework to do as well, as there are many good initiatives um, here in Washington, D.C. So I, I would like to thank um, also the audience members for your participation, uh, for your questions. It was uh, definitely a very thought-provoking discussion. And a big thank you to my colleagues, at the Central and East European Coalition, the ones in front of the camera, behind the camera, Veronica, Clara, Vitas, um, Carl, research assistants. Uh, hopefully I didn't forget anyone. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Grigas, um, Paul, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't know how to thank you because this was A, very timely, um, and B, we are seven, uh, six days away from our midterm elections. So a, a lot will depend upon what happens um, come January when a new Congress comes into session, um, and obviously what happens on the battlefield in Ukraine as well. So um, there's a lot to discuss yet, um, and I hope that we can have you back for for future uh, type of forum discussion. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, have a great rest of your uh, day, and when you see, we'll see you all at the next uh, CEC policy briefing session. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, Michael. Bye. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Thank you.